Hello there, I'm Leonardo Torres. I'm the guy formerly known as the non-Christian reacting to all of your favorite songs and your favorite shows. As I'm sure that you already know, The Chosen recently released season three, episodes one and two in theaters everywhere. And in preparation to that, we recently just re-watched season one and two. And in season one, there's a very special scene with Nicodemus and Jesus speaking in a rooftop. And in that live stream, we analyze that scene from beginning to end, which is what you're about to watch. But before we get to that, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video, Angel Studio. Studios, who without them, I would not have known about The Chosen. You see, when season one came out, Angel Studios reached out to me and asked if I can react to this series live on our channel. And this is the seed that began my journey to where I am currently now as a follower of Christ. See, the way that the story of Jesus and the apostles has been told in The Chosen has been something truly special to me. And I'm sure that it's been something truly special to you, which is why I think it's important to support other filmmakers that are bringing these types of stories to life. And if you agree, I'd like to encourage you to download the Angel Studio app and begin to explore all the different series and films and comedy shows that they have today. Thank you for being here and now let's enjoy this clip. Oh and by the way, feel free to answer any of the questions asked in the comment section down below. I would love to hear your take on every single one of those questions. Would you be on this roof tonight? Right. See here, Nicodemus is feeling like a failure because he says, I didn't do anything for her. And in fact, he felt like he shouldn't have even been there. Right. And just as a saying, hey, if you weren't there, would you be here tonight? It almost feels like he had to be on that rooftop to receive this invitation. And in order for that to happen, all these other things needed to, do, to be put into place, which is why earlier when we ended the, the last live, I specifically gave thanks to, to our father for putting in place the things that are going to to save you in the future for putting in place now the people that you're going to meet in some near future that are going to have the thing that your family needs right now or that healing that you need or that the answer to a question there's the right doctors the right people to offer you an opportunity for a job giving thanks for these things because god puts these things in place and in and, and later on puts you in the right position to be in his presence let's continue I don't know where to start i have so many questions so many questions i love that oh yes i love the lighting here he takes off his robe to make himself more comfortable. They sit in the light. I like how this is filmed on the dark side of their faces. You see the light on the other side of their faces. It's brilliant cinematography here. First question. The Eastern slums. Hmm. Many wandering preachers have succeeded in gathering crowds with their... He's talking about other preachers. Tone. Right. I heard a few of them over the years myself. So you know the type. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard anyone tell a paralytic to get up and walk much less it actually happened see so he says i've seen a lot of preachers who have gathered lots of crowds a huge crowd right so just because you have a huge following doesn't mean that you're doing the right thing that doesn't mean that you're speaking for god right just because you have a super mega church and i'm not trying to throw any stones here but just because you have a super duper mega gigantic church does not mean that you are speaking the words of God, that you are guided by that spirit, right? They talk a big game, but I've never seen them tell someone to walk and actually see them walk right after. So what is your conclusion? He's not giving them the answer. He could have said, well, yeah, right? The difference is that I have my father that's with me and is allowing me to do these things. He didn't do that. He didn't give them the answers. He asked him, what is your conclusion? So that Nicodemus can see and fully understand that and say that out loud. And also to give him the opportunity to say it out loud and confirm his internal suspicion acting alone he's not, not acting alone these signs you do without having god, god in, in him. him only someone who has come from god and how is that belief going over in the synagogue ah. <laughs> <laughs> his answer said it all how would how would it go explaining this in the synagogue Ha! Huh. Like that answer just said it all. Like they're not going to believe this. Which is why we are here. Which is why they're there. So, what else? What else? What other questions what do you have? Have you come here to show us? I love his answer here. The question is this: Like, what have you come here to show us? Not what are you doing here? Not not what's your goal? What are your plans for the future? What do you come here to show us? There's something that we're supposed to be watching. Something that we're supposed to be observing because you're showing us all these signs. You're healing people. But what is it that you're wanting to show us? Here's his answer. A kingdom. I came to show you a kingdom. I came to show you a kingdom. See, Nico is in a troublesome position here because he's not just 
having a conversation with Jesus, with the son of God, who he already knows he is who he says he is. But he's also having an internal dialogue and imagining himself talking to other people, explaining what he, what took place here. And it scares him, which means that he's not fully in this conversation. He's also in his head running by what it would look like, what it would sound like if the people he knows, the high ups, would hear this man say what he's saying. So he's not fully in this conversation. That is what our rulers so, are worried about. That's what they're worried about. Not that kind. He said, no, 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 no. Not that kind of kingdom. A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born a kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. I imagine that up to this point, there's no one who's ever spoken these words in this way, which is why Nicodemus repeats it, fragmented, broken it up, born again. Like, what? what is two simple words, born again? What? What? Do you, what? What? Okay. <laughs> what do you mean? Yes. You mean like a new creature, a conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No. Conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No, that's not what I'm talking about. And, and no, he's not talking about converting. He's not talking about conversion. He's not saying in order for you to be saved, in order for you to enter into this kingdom, you need to be converted from one idea, one belief, one system to another system. No, 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 no. Or one class to another class. No, no, no. Or one nation to another nation. Nothing. No conversion. No, no, no. He's not talking about that. And what is born again? Then what is it? I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. <laughs> My mother, and she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you. So obviously, he's saying, wait, wait, wait. Nothing that you're saying makes sense. Right. The only other option, the only other answer here is what that I return back to my mother's womb because that come on, he's already exhausted all of the possibilities. His mind can't move any further than what he thought he meant. So again, we're going back to the intellectual and Jesus says, no, truly, I say to you. Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That unless one is born of water and the spirit. But I want you to notice the gestures, the gestures that Jesus does. Okay, he touches Nico in a bit. And I want you to notice the gestures so you can see the difference in what he's talking about. That which is born of the flesh. See, so he touches his hand, that which is born of the flesh. So he touches his hand. His flesh. His flesh. That is born of flesh is flesh. But... And that which is born of the spirit. He touches his chest. Spirit. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That part of you. That. That part of you. That part of you. So he's dividing the two. He's saying one thing is of the flesh and the other part is of the spirit. In other words, you have to move not from one idea to another, not from Gentile to, to Jew, but move your existence from this, from the physical, from this world, from the flesh over to the spirit because the flesh desires things of the flesh and it feeds off of the things of the flesh right but when it dies it dies it's done it's over with it returns to dust but the things of the spirit that which is born of the spirit feeds off of the spirit lives off of the spirit and continues and is sustained from the spirit is what must be reborn to new life how can these things be ah teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. He's trying? I know. I know. Do you hear this? See, he's saying, I'm trying. He says, I know. And then he pauses for a second. You see, Familia, this is really interesting to me because it's showing Jesus in all of his wisdom. He's trying different ways of explaining the same thing to get his idea across language. It can't just be one thing. It can't just be the words, right? Imagine how frustrated he would have been if he would have just repeated himself. But no. He takes a moment, he pauses, and then he hears the wind. And the wind there starts to inspire him to share the same message, just slightly different. Listen, what do you hear? The wind. How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear it sound. You... And he's already he already knows the wind, right? It's something that he's experienced many times before, and he doesn't question it. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the spirit, you can recognize his effect. While you cannot see, 
he's trying to move him from his senses, the sensory aspect of him, of the flesh, over to what he knows and recognizes deep within, something that cannot be taught or explained to him. He doesn't know where it's going. He doesn't know how it works. He just knows that it works, that, that the wind is there, that it's present, and that he's connected to it. Trying to move him again, move him from the fleshy over to the spirit. Brilliant. Mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause. Again, he's listening to Jesus, but he's also in his head, which is another another part, another aspect, which is kind of connected to the flesh, is the mind. He's in his mind, imagining him repeating these words to someone, imagining the confusion that's going to stir up, just trying to explain that to another person. So again, he's not fully paying attention to what Jesus is saying. He's thinking about what his words will sound like to somebody else. Imagine if he were completely present. Imagine if he allowed himself to be fully present in what he's saying and let those words, let that lesson, let that teaching transform him. Transform him. What a different conversation this would have been. Teachers of the law. Yes. And I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. <laughs> so if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I... If I tell you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you tell them things about the spirit? Just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. Mm. More miracles. Yes. But even more than that. Do you remember when the children of Israel complained against God and against Moses in the wilderness of Paran? Yes. They wanted to return to Egypt and they cursed the manna that God sent them. And then? They were bitten by serpents and they were dying. But? God and made a way but for them to be healed. Moses lifted the bronze serpent in the desert, and people only needed to look at it. So will the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He says all they needed to do was look at the serpent and they would be healed. Just look. So the Son of Man will also be lifted, so that anybody who looks at him, who looks and believes, will be healed. Believes. Believes in him, believes in him and that he is who he says he is. The main thing is that the people who believe in him and that believe in who he says he is will automatically know the father. Because if you know him, you know the father. And if you know the father, you will have everlasting life. You'll have eternal life. Go forward to John 17, the prayer that he has. He says, I've made you known to them and I will continue to make you known to them so that the love that you have for me will be in them. Familia, oh my goodness, I don't want to go too deep into this, but he's simply saying his mission here is to, to make sure that everybody who's a sinner, who was lost, who got it, the father turned his face away from, that you know him again, that you recognize that he exists, that he is there. And you will know that by seeing the things that I'm doing here. I'm healing the sick. I'm showing you all these signs. And then I will conquer death because I love you and I want you to be where I am. He says that in that prayer, which I've heard dozens of times now, Father, I have made you known to them and I will continue to make you known to them so that the love that you have for me may be in them and that I may also be in them and that may all, we may all be one. People are not dying from snake bites. They're dying from taxation and oppression. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. Then from what? From sin. He didn't come to deliver people from Rome. <sighs> Which is tricky here, right? Because a lot of us are in need. Rome here can be symbolic for many different things. In your home, Rome could be whatever is causing a disturbance in your family, in the dynamic of your family. Rome could be alcoholism and drug addiction. Rome can be your work. Rome can be debt. Rome could be sickness. Rome could be greed. Rome could be so many different things. It's symbolic here. He's, I'm not here to deliver you from Rome. I'm not here to deliver you from that sickness, from all of that. So we could pray for these things and these things could be asked, right? Because also knock and the door shall be answered, right? Asking you shall receive. So yes, he does these things, but that's not what he's here for. He's here to deliver you from sin, to protect us from the evil one, but to, to, to deliver us from sin, to free us from sin from spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. 
that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Familia, from the way that, that I've come to understand this and know this, the Father loves us. At some point, we failed him. We've exiled him from our lives. And then along comes his son, who took on human form. Everything about him was still human. He was not just tempted as a human being. You think he didn't have those temptations there? The same temptations that you and I have, he had. But he didn't fall for it because there was something else in him that was lacking, that was missing. There was no greed in his heart. Otherwise, he wouldn't be love. There was no hatred in his heart. Otherwise, he wouldn't be love. He wouldn't be love. He had a mission here to show that a person can live a sinless life, that people can overcome the temptation with him, of course. I'm not, so don't get ahead of me. Try not to add to what I'm saying. That a person can say no to these temptations. But he was even tempted even more, even bigger, a lot bigger. Because when he went out into the forest to pray, the devil came and, and tempted him in, in a very unique way that only he could have been tempted by. You know, you're hungry, turn that rock into bread and eat. If you're the son of God, do it. Jesus didn't even have to say it. He didn't have to say, turn to bread. He just needed to think it and it would be so. But even his own thinking, he would stop. He would stop his own mind from betraying him. You and I are not tempted by that because I can't turn, I, you and I can't turn stone into, into bread. So that's not really a temptation for us, is it? But it's a huge temptation for him. So he was not just tempted as a human being. He was also tempted as a divine being as well. Anyway, I feel like I'm, I'm going off a little bit, right? But the, the point being is that he lived a perfect life. He died. He lived again so that we could believe that he is who he says he is so that the father says, okay, those that I gave you, those that believe in you, those that have seen you know me and see me and we will all be together because Jesus says in that prayer, I want them where I am. Anyway, let's... <laughs> Let's, let's get back to it. So this has nothing to do with Rome. It's all about sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. Through him? It's as simple as Moses' serpent on the pole. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Have you ever heard anything like this before? The next time you get into some kind of a discussion with someone who questions what the apostles wrote, just have them read the red letters. There's no way that an uneducated human being, and I'm saying it uneducated because I know that the apostles were not formally educated. I know that, that they couldn't have invented what Jesus said. They couldn't have invented and spoken the way that they say he spoke. There's no way. You don't hear that or see that in their normal documentation. It's only when they're quoting him that the language takes a little shift, right? Just have them read that. Just say, look, read, read John and read the parts that are in black and then read the parts that are supposedly Christ. And you tell me if, if the language is the same, because if it's not, then that tells you that they're quoting someone else. I brought that up because he's saying, have you ever heard anyone speak that way? Because he's trying to really document what he's saying as close as he can, word for word, for that same reason. Because if he waits to write that down, he's not going to quote it the same way. It's going to sound like him. But if he writes it right away, it's going to sound like him, capital H. And I met Lilith, Mary, that day. I told my wife and my students, I said, she was beyond human aid. Only God could have healed her. And then I saw her. Healed. Then I saw her face. Now I'm a believer. <laughs> the healer. I, my whole life, I have. Follow me, and you'll see more. Oh, follow me, and you'll see students. more. In two days' time, we leave Capernaum. Come see the kingdom I am bringing into this world. But I, I, I can't. You have a position in the Sanhedrin. Come and see the kingdom that I am bringing into this world. Come and see the kingdom I am bringing 
into this world. I'm bringing into this world. You have family. You are getting advanced in years. <laughs> I understand. But the invitation is still open. The invitation to what exactly? <laughs> to lead a nomadic life, to, to give up who I am. It's true. There is a lot you would give up. But what you would gain is far greater and more lasting. Is this another one of your born again mysteries? <laughs> Maybe. I know mysteries aren't easy for a scholar. Mysteries aren't easy for a scholar. Think about it. Hmm? Take your time. On the morning of the fifth day, we leave and we'll meet by the well in the southern quarter at dawn. Is the kingdom of God really coming? What does your heart tell you? My heart is swollen with fear and wonder. It can tell me nothing except that I am standing on holy ground. <sighs> See, Jesus didn't answer his question. Not here. He, he answered it here. He spoke into his heart. He says, what does your heart tell you? And he says, my heart, it's swollen with fear and wonder, right? Because the unknown is really scary. The unknown is incredibly scary. But he's saying all, that he, all he knows is that he's standing on holy ground. Is he talking about the land? Is he talking about the roof? Not yet. He's saying that the thing that he internally is standing on is holy. That the place that he's in internally, spiritually speaking, mentally speaking, and perhaps even emotionally speaking, is holy. It's, it's sacred. Family, this is where we have our conversations. What are the attributes of a holy space? If you are in a holy space, in a space that is sacred, that is holy, what are the attributes of this space? What do you expect to see? What do you expect to feel? What do you expect to be present in that space, in that moment? I'm going to wait for you all to answer this question so that we can fully understand the position that Nicodemus is, is finding himself in, the space that he's in. I would be so bold as to even say that he answered the question by saying that the kingdom is already there, that he's standing in it in that very moment, right there, right with him. He's standing there. He's already saying. So when he says... <laughs> Oh, my goodness. When he says, what, what does your heart tell you? He's saying, look within, look inside of you. What does your heart tell you? And he's saying, I'm there. I'm already there. Yes, the question is, is the kingdom coming? And the answer to the question is, look, I'm, I'm here right now. Look at what that holy ground is. Love, unexplainable peace. Any place where the Holy Spirit is, is a holy place. Where God is, that is a holy place. The closeness of the Lord, the kingdom is already there with him. But he didn't say that out loud, but he felt it. And please don't go misquoting me by saying that the kingdom is a thing that you feel. It's not a feeling. It's, it's a, it's a, oh, I got to be careful. For me, it's a space. It's a place. That's a space where, where he resides. And unless you're born of the spirit, you can't enter into this kingdom. Ah, uh, you can't enter into this space unless you are born again and you can't understand that. Ah, uh. is the kingdom of God really coming? What does your heart tell you? My heart is swollen with fear and wonder. It can tell me nothing except that I am standing on holy ground. That's the appropriate, I think, reaction to recognizing that you're standing in it. Holy roof. Anyway. That you're standing in it. And then, of course, he makes a joke here. Holy roof, anyway. I do hope you come with us, Nicodemus. You don't have to do that. 
What are you doing? Why, why does he say you don't have to do that? Why, why, do, why does he, Jesus say you don't have to do that? It's the son. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way. The, the music. Who take refuge in him. <laughs> Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Oh, goodness.